So today, um, I'm preaching out of a, a, a book, actually. I don't have one specific scripture reference for you today. So I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. Like the beginning of that, um, the video was, Brendan, did you love your video? You looked a bit like, it was perfect. Oh, Eli needs help. Didn't you love Darren's story? You should watch the whole video. It didn't carry on just that long. It was much longer than that, the frog doctor. And he goes, let me check. And he puts the little stethoscope on and he goes, ribbit, ribbit. And Abby's just standing there like, seriously, is there something in my chest? It's so cute. It's so cute. And then I nearly put my foot in it because at one um, midweek meeting, I said to him, man, I love that video. And he went, what video? I went, no video. There's no video. (laughs) Because it was so awesome watching them come in. Awesome. So today I'm actually on this Father's Day, I'm preaching out of a book, and it's called the Book of Esther. Now you might think that's a weird, it's a weird book to preach out of because it's all about a girl who becomes a queen and who saves the nation. But when I was preparing over the last few weeks and over the last few months of knowing that we were going to have the theme song of of when I'm with you, I'm standing with an army. It's been months. It's probably been from the beginning of the year. All I said was to two or three people, I'm like, this is our theme song and we're going we're gonna to make it work. And it's coming and it's going to be strong. But I want you to understand where we're going with this this morning. And as I've been um, preparing and as I've been studying and, and, and thinking about this, the, only, the book that came to me was the book of Esther. And there were four points that God just dropped in my heart. And I'm going to speak to you about those four points in a minute, and they all start with P's. Isn't that good? Isn't that amazing that I actually did that for some of you brains that like work like that? It's very good for me because I don't normally get points like that. But um, I just want to give you a bit of background so we can all be on the same page. And so basically, the book that I'm teaching out of is Esther. And Esther was a Jewish girl. And she was a little girl, and um, her parents passed away. And her cousin ended up adopting her and making him, making her his own. He raised her, and he became her father, a cousin. Obviously, you know, different people, Joel's got a cousin that's older than him. So, you know, I think Mordecai was older than Esther. And so in those days, he took them in. He was an honorable man. He stepped out and made a difference in somebody else's life. And so Esther is about this girl, and what happens is there's, there's a few parallel stories that, that run in this book. And the first thing in the introduction is that there's a king, King Xerxes, and he's got a queen Vashti, and he's celebrating, and I'm paraphrasing today, right? You should go and read the facts to get all the facts, but I'm giving you the story. And he's having this banquet, and there were lots of wine, and there was lots of drinking, and all the rest. And on one of the days, he actually said, go and fetch my wife, Vashti, who was a beautiful um, queen and beautiful lady, and let her come and dance for us. Because they were having a separate banquet. The men and the women were separate. And so Vashti, at that time, understands what's going on in the, in the men's room and somehow makes the decision that she won't go. She will not go and go and dance for the king and all his guests. And this obviously was a massive embarrassment to the king. And with all his advisors, he calls them around and they're going, this is not allowed. This cannot happen because could you imagine if all the women started treating us like that and stopped submitting to us and were defiling us and, and it was a whole power struggle at that time. And I'm not talking about that today, so we'll just leave that there. And so they advise him to take away her position and give it to somebody else. They advise her, him to banish her from his presence, and so she was never allowed to go back into the king's presence. And so Queen Vashti is pushed out, and he has a period of time where he's got no queen. And so finally he gets a bit lonely, and he's thinking, actually, I, I do want somebody in my life. And his advisors advise him again, saying, why don't we actually audition some young, beautiful virgin girls? and see who can make, be her replacement. And so that's what, exactly what he does. He sends out in the, the invitation for girls to audition, and they all have to come in. And, and part of their, their um, qualification process is that they spend a year in a spa with perfumes and facials and back massages and Juice Plus and Slimming World and all the rest, and a personal trainer. And so they prepare them to get to the point where they actually get to go before the king. And if he liked them, he could make them his wife. And so Esther, she finds favor from the beginning because there's a man called Haggai, and he is the king, he is the oversight over the harem. And he, 
he looks at her and he, and he thinks she's beautiful. And somehow there's a grace upon her and he likes that. So he actually gives her seven concubines and gives her the best place in the harem and goes, you actually go there and whatever you want, you can have. And, he, and she builds a close relationship with him. And Mordecai prepares her and teaches her and says to and, and and obviously raised her in a way and says, This is how you respond, this is what you say, this is what we do, this is what we don't do, and sets the tone for her. And so from day one, she finds favor with him and the harem. And then you see that it gets to the place where she then has her night with the king. And it's make or break, because once he has a night with one of those girls, if he likes them, she stays. If he doesn't, she, go, she goes to another part of the palace where she might live lonely for the rest of her life. You never know. It's very sad if you think about this. So the risk was, either way, n no guarantee whether she would actually have an, a, a, a future with this king or, or whether she would just be another person. But as we can see God working in this, he, um, she gets to that place, and Mordecai says to Esther, don't tell them who you are, where you've come from, what your background is. Just be you. Just be you. Present yourself. Bear gifts. And so what this happens is all these girls that come out of the, the harem, they go, they can take whatever they want. Because once they leave that place where they've just been given everything, they go to another place and they take as much as they can. And Esther doesn't. She just takes what she needs and uh, goes to the king and gives him gifts. Right? She's got a different spirit. And then it gets to another part of the story where there's a baddie. There's always a baddie in a story, right? And this guy names Haman, and he can't stand the Jews. Well, actually, he's full of pride himself. He carries the highest rank at the time above every other noble. And he's got the voice to the king, and he's got the voice to the people. And what happens is Mordecai, the father, or her uncle or her cousin, is sitting at the gate, and he listens, and he's around things, and he understands what's going on, and he discovers there's a plot to kill the king. And he tells Esther, because every day he sat, sat closely with her. She was behind the palace gates, and she was alone on the other side of the wall, but she was never abandoned. And every day he met with her, and how are you doing? Are you still okay? And they had this relationship of continual relationship and interaction and intimacy. And so he finds out about this plot, tells Esther, and the king's life is saved. But nothing gets done for Mordecai at that time. Nothing. No honor, no thank you, nothing. And so Haman comes out and Mordecai is still around the gates every day and he's now decided, because he's so honorable and so noble, that every person needs to bow down to him when he walks past. And Mordecai didn't. He sits at the gate and this guy walks past in and out and it starts irritating so much that the advisors, these advisors were full of wisdom, obviously, as you can tell how they advise, and they say, why don't you kill him. Just take him out. Then he won't be a thorn in your flesh anymore. But Haman was so aggravated by this man that killing him wouldn't actually satisfy that aggravation. He decides to take out the entire nation of Israel. And he has a, a decree written up and gets the king on board. And this is where I want to actually pick up the story. So do you all understand there's a lot going on at the moment? So let's see. Mordecai released Esther into the palace where he no longer could actually control her, look after her, and make the decisions for her. All he could do was send her off with everything he had taught her up until that place. He released her, but he never abandoned her. The story continues as we see Esther honoring Mordecai, going, this is what happens. You know, this guy, he heard this, king is for your life. And he, you see this interaction the whole time. And it speaks volumes about the way she was raised. Because even though she was exalted and promoted into this position of being the queen because she had her night with the king and she was chosen. She never forsook her lowly beginnings. She didn't turn her back on, you know, what was, you know, maybe the back streets of, of Susa at the time and a bit embarrassed about Mordecai. She never did. She had this relationship where it didn't matter how far she went, she never forgot where she came from. And it's very sad to see nowadays, you know, parents pour into the lives of their children and then the children move away and, and then children, you know, you speak to some parents and they go, they didn't phone me. They're a university and they're doing their own thing. And my heart's cry is that we, wouldn't, we would create a space where our children will always come back. They will always come back. And if you're in that place today where you're going, well, that's me, God's will is so much greater because you have put values and instilled truth into these children that they will come back. And so I just want to show you around these things today. Let's look at Esther 
chapter 2. No, chapter 4. All right? I've got it on the screen, so we're going to read together. When Esther's words... Uh, oh, so basically, I think I've left out a part. So he's going to wipe out the Jews. Mordecai finds out about it. He's weeping. He's in sackcloth and ashes. He is mourning. He is fasting. He cannot believe it because his words come out. Esther finds out that her father is behaving this way. She feels really, you know, overwhelmed by it and goes, send him clothes, tell him to get dressed. What is wrong with him? Find out what's wrong with him. And this is where we're picking up. So when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Don't do, okay. I'm going to stop there for a second. Can you take that off? Sorry, Darren. Sorry, guys. I, I, did, I forgot something out. So what happens is he's going to take them out. And he says, so Esther finds out. He goes, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. They are going to t- kill the entire nation of Israel, Israel, Israel. And you actually have got an inroad to the king. Go and say something. And she goes, I can't. I can't say something. Because unless he calls me, he will take me out. Okay? So she can't just approach him. And so this is the conversation. Let's go there now. So when Esther's words were reported back to Mordecai, after she said, I can't do it unless he asks me to, he sends back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jew- Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family, father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's the title of my message today to you guys to you fathers, you are living your such a time as this moment right now. And it's so easy to read a story like this or look at somebody who lives next to you or somebody that you think is is great and making a difference and earning money and building businesses and making building orphanages and raising a troop of people. And it's easy to sort of step back and go, they are living there for such a time as this because they're making a difference in the world. But today I want to give you a bit of advice Don't look for something else to take your eyes off what your call is. If you don't know, if you've never been told this, you are right now living your for such a time as this. Everything in God has purpose. And so Esther sends this reply back to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. And as the story goes on, the entire nation of Israel fasted and prayed, and three days later she approaches the king. And the king holds out his scepter, and then she gets to have a conversation with him. This is your for such a time as this. Your life counts. Your life matters. And the plans that God has for your life I'm talking to fathers today, but also to us as believers, is going to make a difference. Because sometimes we think the smallest thing we do is not seen. Or sometimes we forget that the things that we don't do isn't seen either. But there are people, and especially on this day today, to remind us, that are watching. Our children are learning from us, whether we are consciously teaching them or whether we unconsciously hold back. Every single thing we do There are a generation of eyes and hearts being shaped by our behavior. And that is huge, huge responsibility. We might read the book of of Esther going, okay, well, she had to save an entire nation. But you are preparing a generation of children who will take on leadership roles, who will be able to go before us and speak into truth in areas where there's darkness and brokenness and captivity and and, um, even in their schools where there's bullying and where there's uh, just, you know, gossiping and and just things that go on, if we don't teach them that they have a voice and if we don't show them that we've got their backs, how are they going to take on the world? And so your living, your living right now is for such a time as this. It is important. It is vital that we do it well. So there you go, a girl who's presented with a massive task, a huge task, a task that maybe threatens her own life, But not only hers, the lives of every other person is hanging in the balance of whether she does this or not. Something that seems a little bit uncertain. Something that maybe doesn't even guarantee an outcome that you think you need. Has anyone else been in that situation? Where you're facing this this battle, this thing, this wall that you're up against, and there's no guarantee of what the outcome will be. 
and it seems overwhelming and you're a bit uncertain as to what would happen if you took that step. And all you have to do is switch on the news. You know, all you have to do is flick through Facebook. All you have to do is just look at what's happening around the world today. There are uncertainties around every corner. There are question marks about the people that are speaking into the lives of our children. There are question marks about our futures and how we're doing marriages and, and are marriages strong and is the church strong? But let me tell you today, it is. And your voice matters and your life can make a difference. And even though there is an uncertain future, we have a certain God who doesn't leave us. I saw a quote this week on Facebook that says, I wouldn't change my children for the world, but I would change the world for my children. Do you know you've got the power to do that? Do you know? I've, I was listening to another teaching that, that just this, the last few weeks, and it was about um, a mother of, of boys, and, and the boys brought this book home, and they were sitting reading, and they were a high school kid, and this whole book was completely defiled speaks about things that children should not be exposed to, you know, things that are happening in the world. And the mother said, and the, as the boy turned the page, the big heading on the next page caused him to, to jump up and go, I'm finished, you can't read, you can't turn the page, mom, please don't. He was so embarrassed because he didn't know what was happening around the corner. And she said, what is going on in that book? And she opened it and she was shocked. And so what happened is she phoned the teacher and she said, did you know that this was in the book? Complete pornography in the book of a school book in America. And the teacher went, oh yeah, the boys love it. And she said, well, my kid won't read it. And she said, I don't want you to single him out, and I don't want you to put, put him on the spot. I'm just telling you, give him another option. And so what happened is the son goes back to school, and this teacher singles him out, makes him feel little, gives him a girl's book, and, and goes, oh, some people's mother aren't happy about this book. And so he felt so embarrassed, and the teacher, she phoned him, she said, I've given him another option. Like she's done this massive... Um, favor for this kid and the boy gets home a teenage boy in high school comes home and he breaks down and he tells his mom what happened how embarrassed he was because sometimes when you stand up for your children they get embarrassed because people don't know how to deal with it so you think that's where you stop because you don't want to embarrass your child she phoned the headmaster and she said she wants the whole book pulled the book pulled from the school and they said oh well, we're not too sure if you do, we should do that. She says, well, if you don't do that, I'm actually going to the reporters, I'm going to TV, I'm going bigger. I'm going much bigger and the whole world will find out about this. And they said, uh, we don't, we, please don't do that. She said, why? Give me a reason why not to. They're like, well, we don't want you to. So she did. She had that book pulled. One book, she went to family, you know, focus on the families and stuff like that and said, what can we do? Help me out. They said, you do not know and understand the power you have as a parent to actually have a voice over what happens to, in, your, in your child's life. Sometimes we hold back because we think, that's a bit scary. What if my child is picked on? What if it doesn't matter? That entire book was pulled from not just her school, but their entire curriculum around the country where they went to school because she said, I will not have my child reading this book. And how come all the other mothers are okay with their children reading this book? It's like Jaden going to school and be giving a book like that. This is real fights that we're in. So you have to understand that you can change the world for your children. You can sow into a future that's different to the one that you've experienced or the one that you've come out of. See, we've all got different battles to fight. We've all got different barriers to overcome. And some might seem overwhelmingly huge in your life. But the theme of today is, this is your for such a time as this. You are living your for such a time as this. And you need to know that you are not alone. We've sung songs this morning. We've had a theme song. When I'm with you, I'm standing with an army. And although it is for Father's Day, when you let people stand on your shoulders, when you let your children come and hang on you and see how strong you are, when you make a stand, when you work hard, when you sacrifice, you are not doing it just because you have to. You are shaping the future of those who are coming. Esther might have been the only one going into the inner courts and the only one who would stand before the king, and the only one that seemed to be risking her life, but she was never alone. You might be the only one that needs to stand up and say, we don't talk like that. We don't read this. We don't respond like that. This is how we do these things. This is a non-negotiable in my life. But you're never alone. See, there was a Mordecai that was praying for her. There was an entire nation who said, if you do this, we've got your back. So once she stepped in, she wasn't standing alone ever. 
when you go into a meeting and you're overwhelmed, when you sit in a doctor's office and you're confused and scared, when you sit in front of your school teacher's parents' meetings, when you sit in front of a contract or a contractor or whatever it is, when you sit in front of a broken person and you think, I don't know how to deal with this, you are never alone. There is always a God who is with you. There is not only just a, a, a one person praying for you, but an army of people praying for you. Hello, Elaine. When Moses had to go before Pharaoh, he had to take a stand. He was the only one standing before Pharaoh, but there was a nation counting on him. There was a God who set him up for success. Although he stood alone, he was never abandoned. When we realize and our eyes and our understanding are open and aware to the truth that you are standing with an army, what would you do? What would you say? How would you step forward and how would you respond if you could see what was going on around you? If you could see that there was somebody who's already gone before you, people that have got your back, people who would go down with you and go down for you, how would you respond? How would you respond if we understood that God is so good and his ways are so perfect? What would you say? What conversations would you have? What non-negotiables would you set up? Because if we could see what God sees and understand what he's already promised, I'm sure we would live very differently. We would take risks that we've never taken before. We would, st we would stand a little bit stronger, maybe stand a little bit taller, Maybe stand a little bit longer before we give up and go, well, I tried. She didn't go, oh, King, oh, actually, I'm a bit nervous, and withdraw. She went boldly and said, this is what is happening, and I need to meet with you. She could have walked past the inner court and just gone, sorry, I'm in the wrong place, please forgive me. But she didn't. She stood. She was braver because she knew there was a nation backing her. She found courage when she had no courage. And the impossible still stared her down in the face in the face, and you might be looking at an impossible situation today going, I don't know my way around this. But there were people who were lifting her, those who were carrying her. And she still had to navigate it. She still had to navigate the not knowing how he would respond, not knowing if he would even respond to her request. But she had to take the stand. And I'm sure it looked like she was fighting the battle on her own. Because it's easy for Mordecai to go, you go and do it. Sometimes that's you. Somebody goes, I'm praying for you, but you still have to sit and hear the news, have the conversation, hand in a piece of paper, and you think, it's great that you're praying for me, but I still actually have to do this? And she probably felt like this, but somehow she knew that it was the only way. See, the thing about this book is that it's an, an entire book dedicated to the story of Esther, an entire book, and not once is God mentioned in this book. Not once is it God said, he intervened, he went around the corner. However, if you read it and you see it, never, and it, not never, but it's hard to actually separate him from what's going on because every single thing is planned, every single thing is set up, every single thing has an, an outworking. And it's a beautiful reminder that even though you can't see him in your situation today, if you're finding you're fighting a threat or something overwhelming or something that's uncertain, it's a beautiful reminder to say, God, I can't see you, and I might not hear you, and I can't feel you, and I don't know if you're here with me right now, but I trust you that you've actually gone before me, and as I continue to go, you will make it way. See, the thing is about this that I saw is that sometimes the hardest step is the first step. Once she took that first step and said, I will do it, regardless of what's happening in my life, regardless of what people will say about me, regardless of, she says, if I perish, I perish, so be it. Like, you do your bit, I'll do my bit, I'll do this. Once she took the first step, the other steps started opening for her. Once she stepped into the inner courts and the king saw her and held up his golden scepter, she could actually ask him for something more. And as she took that step, he goes, what else do you want? Then she took another step. Maybe today... I just want to remind you, take that step. If you're sitting back going, I don't know what is going to happen. I don't know the uncertainties. He's going, take the step. The first step sometimes is the hardest step. But once you do, you step into a new realm of knowing what God is going to do. And so here you go. Every time Esther went to, to the king, she didn't go to get. 
and you read the story and you read it over again, every time she went to him, she didn't go, I need this from you. She gave him something. She didn't come to get, she came to give. Give him an opportunity. She held a banquet for him, and then she held another banquet for him. That speaks of honor, of speaking about servanthood, of speaking about generosity. She didn't come just to get, but to give. She took the first step and found favor with the king. Then she requested a banquet with the king. Then she requested another one. There's a process. And that's the reminder today as well. Your first step might not be your answer, but it's well on the way to becoming your answer. And as it unfolds, the king finds out about the plot to, to wipe out the Jews and, and includes that it's his wife who is a Jew at the time and Haman's plot against Mordecai is exposed and it all happens around the dinner table. You should go and read this. It is brilliant. It's like if you have a creative mind, you'll see a whole movie happening before your eyes. And so here are the four things I want to remind us today on the account of Esther, what every single one of us can learn. You are living in your for such a time as this. Today is Father's Day, and there are little people who are watching you. Today is not just Father's Day, but it is Church's Day, where there are nations and people that you're doing life with going, how come you can do life differently to me? Do you have an answer because I need an answer? How come you can be peaceful in a situation that calls for no peace? How come you can continue when you've had a bad day? How come you can forgive when that person was really, really wrong to you? How come? All these questions. Because there are people going, this is your for such a time as this. If you can do it, I can do it. So here, number one, you have to remember this. You have got permission. If God has called you to live your for such a time as this, he has given you permission. Permission for what? Permission to be exactly who you are. Not anybody else. Not defined by what the past has said, what generational curses have said, or what any other person's opinion has said. He has given you permission to be you, to carry out your for such a time as this moment. Let's look at Esther. She was an orphan girl. She was adopted. And she was a little Jewish girl in a race that was, you know, still fighting for their survival. If, she, if those were her qualifying attributes, she would have been disqualified. And so Mordecai says to her wisely, don't tell them who you are. You don't have to be held back by what your, what your past has said to you, what your fathers, your mothers, whether you've had great parenting or not so great parenting, whether you've had a great upbringing or not so, whether it's been rocky or whether it's been great, that has no bearing on your for such a time as this moment right now. You have permission to be exactly who you are. You have permission to, to make mistakes and to work it all out. You don't have to have it all together. Esther didn't have it all together when she walked into that palace that day. All she knew was she had a father who released her and believed in her and said, now go and live what you've been taught and don't live it for yourself. You have permission to live a life that impacts other people. That is your reminder. Even though you're scared, because she was scared. Even though she was nervous, it's okay to be nervous. Even though she had to make the mistakes and learn along the way, it was her moment. You are positioned. Number two, you are positioned for this. I thought I had slides, but obviously I didn't. Whenever you, wherever you find yourself today, you have a place of influence. Think about it. Where are you finding yourself today? And I'm looking out at everyone because now I can see all of you. Some of you might have very high businesses that are people are looking to you, waiting for direction. Some of you might be le leading a church of thousands and a, and a community outreach that you don't even know how far it's touching people's lives and setting them up for success. Some of you might be looking for a job. Some of you might be raising world changers and leaders and people who are actually going to make a difference in the future. You are positioned right now where God needs you to be positioned. Esther was positioned right where God needed her to be positioned. An orphan girl who was adopted and who was given a chance to go in and make a difference. You have, you have influence. Whether it is good influence or bad influence, you are influencing somebody's opinion. That is something very real we have to understand. Sometimes we think when we do something on purpose, when we've planned it, prepared it, and we've set ourselves up, and we've had a good day, and shown the, shown the people how we should be responding and stuff like that, that's good. We've influenced somebody. But do you know the opposite works exactly, whether you never open your mouth or you never do something great. 
you are influencing somebody's perception about who God is because we are his representation, how good he is, how bad he is, what he can do, what he can't do, what we're trusting him for, we have a position of influence. People are watching you. You are shaping ideas and futures for people who are looking. Your life is meant to make a difference. God says you are a city on a hill, shining brightly. That's his plan for you. You are positioned for greatness, to set an example, to instill values and teach and carry somebody on your shoulders. You are graced for the position you carry. If you find yourself in a place going, I don't like this position right now, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. The unknown, the uncertainties, the big questions, the little tiny tasks, the awesomeness of being in the palace and celebrating everything you want. You are positioned and you are carried by his grace to carry this position well. Whether you are a father, a parent, a business owner, a creative person, a student, or an employer or an employee, you are positioned and carried by grace. Number three, you have purpose. You have got permission to be who you are, to be in the position that God has put you in because it is all for his purpose. The position you find yourself in right now is for a purpose. Your influence will make a difference in someone else's life. And to achieve the things that you thought were never, ever possible, everything you are going through right now has a purpose. Everything that you find yourself balancing and running around is to change the course of history. The purpose is not defined by your background. Esther wasn't going to give up. Her parents were murdered by the same guy who was trying to take out the Jews. Her parents were taken out by these people who always were against the Israelites because they served a God and not their own prideful ways. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't do these things. And so here she is, a repeat of history. What her parents couldn't fight, she now gets to stand and make a difference. If you think your past holds you back, Esther proves that it does not. If God has positioned you to make a change for the future, you have got everything it takes. You might be seeing it as a failure, or you might just have a nudge or an invitation to stand and speak, because something you're thinking, I can't do this. My, my parents couldn't win this battle, I can't win this battle. Might just be your little thing that God's going, why won't you stand and say something? Why don't you stand up and make a difference? Why don't you draw a line and saying, I'm not going to accept this over my family's life and my children's life because, God, you have a greater purpose for me. See, your life is greater than yourself. Esther didn't go into the palace for herself personally to be protected. She went into a palace in a place of influence, positioned to be herself, to make a difference for a nation. Your life carries far more weight than just the four walls that you find yourself in. It's your time to stand and to have a voice. And my fourth point is, where God has given you permission to be yourself, he has positioned you for a purpose. He will and does protect you. He's not sending you into a lion's den without actually shutting their mouths. He's not sending you into a fire without the battle turning on itself. He has protected you because if he sends you, he positions you to be yourself in who you are. Not something you're not, everything you are. Because when the fight calls, take heart. Remember, you are not alone. Esther stood in the midst of the king on behalf of a nation, but she never stood alone. There were an army of people. There was a God who was completely, intricately woven into the story, whether you can see him or whether you can't see him. He was there. She was never alone. And so in Deuteronomy 31.6, I think we've got that slide, it says in the New International Version, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. When she was abandoned, when she was orphaned, when she was left alone, when she was sent into the, uh, to the, the palace doors and before the king, she never, ever stood alone. She was never forsaken or never left alone. And in closing, I just want to say one last scripture. It's Hebrews 13.5. Did you find it, Darren? Hebrews 13.5. I want you to see this. Let your character, your moral essence, 
your inner nature, be free from the love of money, shun greed, and be financially ethical, being content with what you have, for he has said. I just want to stop there for a second, if you go back. I know it's saying financial and all the rest, but the financial is something in this world, like Denver's been teaching us over the last few weeks, that it's, you know, the world teaches you it's either money or it's God, or it's money or it's God, and it's, it's not about money and all the rest. It's about actually keeping our eyes on God. Everything is about keeping our eyes on God. So read the scriptures that, like, let your character be free from anything that takes you away from who God is. All right? For he has said, read this, I will never, under any circumstances, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless. I will not, sorry, nor will I forsake you or let you down or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Isn't that the most beautiful scripture ever? I will not, I will not, I will not leave you, forsake you, leave you helpless, rest my hold on you, relax my hold on you. I will never put you down or walk away or turn my back. This is your for such a time as this moment. And you are not standing alone. And today I just want to pray for everyone. My prayer today is for fathers, for mothers, for us as a church, for believers, for His Church London, that we would be faithful to the position that we have been called to wherever you find yourself today, faithful to actually be the answer to the next generation, to the people sitting next to you, alongside you, people who are still supposed to join this journey, people who are, who are going, there has to be a hope. There has to be something more to this life. I implore you, live your such a time as this moment right now. Rise up, be the voice, take the stand, because you are permission to be yourself. Don't be anybody else. You are positioned for a purpose and his protection has already gone way ahead of you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Father, I thank you that today, God, we can live out for such a time as this moment. God, it's not saved up for big people who are qualified, who have gone, gone ahead of us or people we, we compare ourselves to, but God, it is for us right now. You are living your for, for such a time as this. And so, God, I pray that we would learn to have the permission that you've given us, God. That we would receive your grace, you say, that is so much more than what we need to do everything you've called us to do, Father God. That we are positioned exactly where you need us. God, that we would find purpose in what we're doing, found it in you, Lord God, as we draw near to you, as we stay close to you, Father, you would whisper truths. You would make clear things that are uncertain, Lord God. And as we face things that are overwhelming and, and maybe intimidating, Father God, we will still find strength to stand, to be a voice, and to live a life beyond our own. To create a space for people to step into our lives, God, to participate, to understand, and to get to know you, Lord God, because of the purpose which we are living with, Lord God. And I thank you that you would protect us. You will not leave us. You will not forsake us. You will not relax your hold on us, Father God. You will not let us down or, or even turn away from us. But, Father, you, would, you assure us you have got us. And so, God, I thank you that our eyes would be opened. Our eyes would be opened. Our understanding would be opened. And we would see the backing of heaven, God, and therefore be able to take that first stand. And as we do that, Lord God, that step, we would see you go before us and open doors that no man can shut. Father, I thank you that this place would be a place of salvation. God, I thank you that this place would be a place of healing. And so, Father, right now, I thank you for the opportunity that we could pray for people. And if you're in this place today, I would love to pray with you. This is a season where God wants to, to, for us to know exactly who he is. And if you need prayer today, I would love to pray for you. If you're in this place and you're going, I don't even know how to pray to God because I don't actually know the relationship that I have with him. If you're here today, I would love to pray. God says he sent his son so that not one of us would be having to walk alone, fighting battles that are too big for us and uncertainties. And he's, he sent his son so that not one of us would have to go alone because he made a way for us. And if you're here today and you need to say, actually, I need to step into that place with you, Jesus. And I just surrender my everything because you've positioned me to be myself for a purpose. And you protect me in this purpose. I'd love to pray with you right now. Just raise your hand and say, I need Jesus and I need that space. And I, and I need him to, to just show me 
Amen. And just surrender your life to him and say, God, use my life for something greater than what I'm doing. And if you're in this place and you're facing an overwhelming situation and you're not too sure what the outcome would be and it might be uncertain or overwhelming or intimidating and you're going, I just need to know that I'm not alone. That when I'm with you, God, I am standing with an army. If you are standing and you're in that place today, please raise your hand. I would love to pray with you. Or if you are standing on behalf of somebody who needs a breakthrough, who needs to know they are not alone, let's pray for them. Just show me where you are and we will pray for them that they are not fighting their battles alone. In Jesus' name, thank you. And so today, I'm the third prayer is that every one of us would do our for such a time as this well and strong with purpose and conviction, knowing that we're not just doing it for ourselves, but for a generation that needs Jesus. I would like to pray for you as well. And so far, for those of you who need to who step into that place with Jesus, let's, let's just all pray together. Father, you can pray with me. Father, we thank you for what you did on the cross. That you made a way for us. We, we, we release, we, well, we repent. We repent and we give you our lives, God. We step out of the way and we say, have your way in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, that you died and you rose again so that I can have a full life. Amen. For those of you who are standing on behalf of people, God, I thank you that mountains can become molehills. Father, that, 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 that seas that separate people from their purpose and their destiny can be separated and people can walk through on dry land. God, where people are facing an uncertain, unknowing battle, God, you've already gone before them. And Father, they'd be able to stand their ground knowing that you are a God that brings the answer. And we thank you, Father God, that as there are people who are praying for people today, God, right now we lift them up to you, Lord God. Every person that needs Jesus, they would find salvation. Your word says, today is the day of your salvation. Do not harden your hearts. And so God, we ask you that hearts would be soft, that you, you give them the gift of repentance. God, I thank you that you are kind. Your kindness leads us. And so, Father God, I pray for every son, daughter, child that are as far from you, God, that they would find their way to you today in Jesus' name. People who have forgotten that there is a God in heaven who believes in them. God, that they would be reminded today that they are positioned to be themselves, permissioned to do this life, working it out with you. And so, God, I thank you that today we would be realigned with who you are and what we are doing on earth at this time, Lord God. And I pray over this church, every person, Lord God, and the, the worlds we live in and the impact we have on the people around us, that we would live out for such a time as this well. In Jesus' name we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, and, and show us clearly, Lord God. Help us make that first step. Help us stand strong, stand longer, be the voice, and not hold back in any way. And we just say thank you for what you're still going to do in our lives and through this church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Amen.